Welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable from Washington Street Studios. I'm Phil Bernberg. Today we're going to be continuing the discussion of tips for successful glazing. Last time we talked in part one of this subject, we talked about glaze compositions and preparation and mixing of the glazes. In this session, in this session we're going to be talking about existing glazes, that is glazes that have already been made up and they're ready for use supposedly in your studio, the surface preparation for the work, and finally the application of the glazes. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. So pre-made or existing wet glazes. First of all, when you, if, you're, if you have a glaze that's already been, been, been made up previously, make sure that you stir or mix the, the, the glaze thoroughly before you use it. And I should recommend this, that in general, you don't want to shake glazes to mix them up, especially commercial glazes in, and underglazes in jars. You don't want to shake them because shaking, especially the commercial glazes and then the glaze, does two things. It doesn't really do a good job of mixing because the gum or the thickener really doesn't move around very thoroughly. The second thing it will do, though, it will introduce air bubbles in the glaze, which you don't want to do. So I really don't recommend shaking any glazes to, to mix them. You're much better off with stirring them or using a high shear mixer or a paddle to do the mixing. So once you've, once you've thoroughly mixed the glaze, then you might, it's a good idea to sort of check the consistency of the glaze. Is it still the right, are there still the right proportions of water and, and powder? Is the glaze fluid enough or too fluid for the application method you want to use? And I still like the old fashioned, what they call the finger test, where you dip your finger into the glaze and look at it, look at the coating you get on your finger to see the consistency of the glaze. What you're shooting for in most cases is when you dip your finger, a dry finger, by the way, it has to be dry, you drip a dry finger into the glaze and you're looking for a coating of glaze on your finger where you can still see the creases in your finger and you can still see the line around the edge of your fingernail. If you can't see the creases in the, in the finger and the line around your fingernail, then the glaze is too thick. Excuse me. And as you can also, if you can see the, if you can see your finger through the glaze, it's too thin. And I found that even though it's it's an old way of testing it, it's still in. Especially once you've worked with a glaze for a while and you know what the glaze is like, it's still I found is a very practical, useful way of judging the glaze consistency. Okay, so now you've, you've looked at the glaze and you're, you're ready to, and you're, you're thinking about using it. One of the first things you may notice though when you, when you, when after you've mixed up the glaze, or if, even if you haven't mixed it up yet, if the glaze looks thin in the bucket, that is, that is when you're stirring it or when you first open the, the, take the lid off the bucket and you're looking at it, and the glaze looks watery and thin, the temptation might be to say, well, it's, I, need to, I need to remove some water. I've run into this situation, especially in community studios and schools, where you never know if somebody who used the glaze before you might have said, oh, this glaze is too thick, I need to add some water to it. People are always sort of adjusting glazes. And so you might be tempted to say, well, I need to, I need to remove some of the water. The, gla the water, the glaze seems to be kind of watery. Don't. Because what you should always do if the glaze looks watery, especially after th sitting, is you want to do what's called flocculating the glaze. Let me, I'm going to just, I want to write these terms on the board just so we can, we can refer to them. So we're going to be talking about two, two effects, flocculation and deflocculation. Flocculation and de... I'm not going to write it out. Deflocculation, okay? We need to back up a little bit to talk about these effects. When you talk about flocculation, what we're talking about is the tendency of, for clay particles when they're suspended in water to sort of join together loosely and form sort of a loose network or house of cards structure in the, in the liquid. And this is, let's go back to some of these models that I was showing before. This was the original model I showed in one of the earlier sessions that I made of sort of what typical wet clay would look like. And when this, when this clay now is broken up and suspended in a glaze as an ingredient, these individual bundles would separate, so they wouldn't be packed together like this. But when you flocculate the glaze, what you're actually doing is you're causing the clay particles in the glaze recipe to form an open sort of gel structure. And this is basically what the flocculated clay would look like suspended in the glaze. 
This is actually a condition that you want to exist in most glazes because what this does is when the glaze, when the clay forms this structure, it almost sort of gels. The glaze, the glaze gets kind of thick and creamy. And what that does is in each one of these spaces between the clay particles, the other glaze ingredients get trapped. So it, it tends to prevent the glaze from settling out as quickly. The glaze appears to be thick and sort of gel-like or creamy-like, and it holds everything in suspension. So this is the flocculated condition. And deflocculated is kind of the opposite. This is when the clay particles, instead of forming this nice open network structure, they tend to, it's, the structure tends to collapse. And the clay particles tend to just pile up on one another. And so this same structure, deflocculated, might look more like this where all the clay particles have just kind of settled together. Well, when the glaze, when the glaze settles together like this, essentially then, the, all the materials in the glaze bucket settle to the bottom, and you typically end up with that hard mud or concrete-like stuff on the bottom of the bucket, and, and the, the particles have settled out, so you end up with the extra water in the, in the bucket sitting above all the, all the solids, which is why the, the glaze seems to be watery. It's only watery because all the water is no longer mixed in with the ingredients. The water and the, and the solids have separated. So what you'd really like to do, when you see that the glaze appears to be watery, you want to flocculate the glaze. You want to cause the, the clay particles to go back to this condition. And the way you do that is you add something to the glaze that acts like an acid, like a chemical acid. It, it can either be an acid or it can act like a chemical acid. And what that actually does is it actually changes the electrical charges. The clay particles actually have a very tiny electrical charges on them when they're in the water, suspended in the water. And the charges tend to attract opposites and form this, this structure enough where it, it's held it together but not totally repelled. And this is what the effect of the acid is. And the, the, probably the, the best single thing to do that with is Epsom salts. Epsom salt, Epsom salt chemically, chemically Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. And the, probably the most common use is people put it in hot water and soak their feet in it. But it also is a great glaze ingredient. So chemically, it's this. It's magnesium sulfate and with some water as part of it. And so you can buy it in just about any, any drugstore or any grocery store. And a container like this is about $4. It usually comes in something packed like this. This is a lifetime supply for you and about 100 of your Potter friends. So if you're a member of a club or a studio, don't send everybody out to buy one of these. You need one for the whole studio. This will last you a lifetime. And it's very soluble in water. Typically what I do for the Epsom salt is I take some Epsom salt and I put it in a jar and I add some water to it and I keep adding the Epsom salt to the water until no more will dissolve. So I'll end up with a little, a little pickle jar or something and I'll have a layer of the Epsom salt on the bottom that's undissolved and the water above it. That means that when it won't dissolve anymore, that means that the solution is saturated. And the nice thing about that is, that means over time, as it sits in the jar, if water evaporates, it won't change in composition. It won't change in concentration. Because if some of the water evaporates, then some of the Epsom salts drops out of solution. So it always stays the same. So it won't change. And I won't, I won't have to worry about one time I need one teaspoon full of it, and another time I need three teaspoons full of it. It's very, and you don't have to do any measurement. I just dump it in and stir it until it doesn't dissolve. Okay? So, Typically, the, what, we, what you would do is you would stir up the glaze thoroughly, and then you'd add a little bit of Epsom salt solution. You don't want to add just a dry Epsom This is just a white powder. You don't want to add the white powder. You want to add it in the form of a solution. And what you would do is you would add a little bit to the glaze, stir it thoroughly, and watch it, and watch and see what happens. Add a little bit more, and what you're looking for is you're looking for the consistency of the glaze to change from thin and watery to creamy, and it's almost instantaneous. When you start, when you, if you drop a teaspoonful, let's say, of the liquid of the Epsom salt solution in, and you stir it right there, you'll see right there where the solution hits the glaze that it has turned that little part 
the consistency to this creamy. But then when you stir it in, it probably isn't enough to do the whole bucket, so you need to add more. So you want to, you want to keep adding it a little bit at a time with stirring until the whole consistency of the thoroughly stirred bucket has this nice thick creamy consistency. You don't need a lot. For a five gallon bucket of glaze to defloc to flocculate it, I might only need three teaspoonfuls or, or a couple of teaspoonfuls of the solution. I don't need a lot. But the point is, you want to do it by you want to do it individually depending on how much it needs at the time. If you see a glaze recipe that calls for Epsom salts as part of the recipe, don't put it in because there's no way to know exactly how much Epsom salts is needed. It's possible to put too much in and then you can actually get the opposite effect. You can deflocculate the glaze. So you never want to just automatically add Epsom salts to a glaze. You want to add it when it needs it. Beside the fact that most glazes when you prepare them with, with new clay and new ingredients in them, they are naturally flocculated anyway. So you don't need the Epsom salts from the beginning. So another, another precaution I'd say is if you get a glaze, and I've seen some recipes that suggest adding a gum solution to counteract settling in the glaze, don't do that. Because the gum can make the glaze stringy, actually stringy and kind of gooey, and it can change the application consistency. And also, the gum after a while, this an organic gum sitting in the glaze will rot, and it will decompose and give you this horrible smelly glaze and the, the gum goes away, it basically decomposes, but the smell stays with you. So by far and away, what you want to do is flocculate the glaze. Save gums for brushing glazes. We'll talk about that later when we talk about application, but don't use gums to settle this problem. Um, the other, the other, another really big benefit of flocculating the glaze, beside the fact that you've, you've really handled the glaze correctly, is it basically eliminates runs and drips. One of the causes, one of the major causes, or the major cause of running and dripping on, on a glaze is when the glaze is deflocculated. So if you have a bucket of glaze and you dip a pot into it, and as you're, you're removing the pot from the glaze, the glaze is sheeting, flowing in sheets down the surface of the pot and dripping off the bottom, that's because the water that was in the glaze is not being absorbed quickly enough by the pot. And if the glaze is deflocculated, the water cannot be absorbed that quickly. So there's a drastic difference. I did a, I did a demonstration a number of years ago at a workshop where I had a, a, a badly deflocculated glaze and I had two plates. So I dipped one plate into the glaze and as I'm pulling it out, the glaze is flowing down off the surface of the pot and collecting at the bottom and dripping. And I'm getting these really ugly looking flow lines and thickened lines where the glaze ran on the plate. So I deflocculated the glaze and I took another plate which was made out of the same clay bisque in the same schedule. So the two plates were essentially identical. And I dip this one into the, into the flocculated glaze and as I'm lifting it out of the glaze, about two inches above the level of the liquid, the glaze was already dry. And I could essentially handle the glaze because the water had been absorbed so quickly, it didn't have a chance to cause these runs and drips. So, aside, so that's another benefit of the, of the flocculated glaze. It really will eliminate a lot of the, the running and dripping problem. Okay. Um, the other, so the, the, the other thing that the other thing that can happen is that if the glaze appears too thick when you first open the bucket and it seems to be too thick, don't assume that you need to add water. Where before we we're talking about you jumping to the conclusion that you need to remove water, don't assume that you need to add water because the first thing to do would be stir the glaze really thoroughly because the glaze the glaze might be just what's called thixotropic. When you say a glaze is thixotropic, what you mean is that as you st when you try to stir it initially, it seems to be kind of thick and heavy and it's hard to stir. And as you stir it more and more, it gets runnier and thinner and easier to stir. That's a characteristic of th something being thixotropic. It's also called shear thinning. More, the more general term is shear thinning, which means that as you're moving the particles around, and the reason for that is because when you start off with a structure like this, this, as I mentioned, this, it's flocculated, it can be kind of heavy and rigid and it's hard to stir. And the more I stir it, I start breaking these things apart and they finally start moving. And so it starts to look more, more like a liquid rather than like custard. And it may just be that if the glaze has this, this thixotropic property, it probably has a lot of clay in it, and it may just be that it needs thorough stirling. So don't stirring, don't just assume that you need to add more water to it. Okay, and finally, um, 
Finally, um, I guess I, but I, as far as the, the handling the, the glaze that's in the bucket, don't, uh, after, a, after a bucket of glaze has been sitting around for a while, you notice that dried glaze tends to accumulate around the rim and on the walls of the bucket. I really recommend is don't scrape the walls, even though it sounds like you're being economical, don't scrape the glaze that's stuck to the walls of the bucket down into the glaze, because all you're gonna do is make lumps, dried lumps in the glaze, and you might have to rescreen the whole bucket again. Related to that is I've been in some studios where they really recommended that, let's say you glazed a piece and you were cleaning the pot off and there was extra glaze you're removing. And so they recommended that you, you scrape the glaze, the dried glaze back into the bucket to save the glaze. It's not worth it. Because again, all you're doing is you're making lumps that, you're gonna, that are gonna go back into the bucket and you'll have to rescreen the whole bucket. So glaze is not that expensive. It's not worth making lumps for the sake of saving that little bit of glaze that you're scraping off your pots. So don't do it, don't put it back in the bucket. If you wanna save it, save it and use it the next time you're preparing the glaze from scratch. But don't put it in the wet bucket. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for The Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, so those are the comments that I had on the... Uh, on the, on the pre-made existing glazes. Let's talk now a little bit about surface preparation. That is, what do you do to the surface of the pots before you glaze them? Well, one of the things that's, that's fairly common to do is to use some sort of a resist on different parts of the pot to prevent the glaze from, from attaching itself to that part of the pot. For instance, it's very common to use a, a resist on the bottom of a pot so that you don't have to do all the scraping and cleaning of the pot later. Probably the most common type of resist would be a wax resist. The wax resists that are most often used are wax emulsions. They're actually suspensions of tiny little wax particles in water, and they can be brushed on or painted on or dipped on. People, and it was fairly common in the past, people would just use melted wax and they might have a pan, like a, 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 a fr an electric fry pan with a little bit of wax in it melted and you could dip the pots in it. But I found the wax resist, Franklin personally, is much more useful because I don't have to worry about having it heated and, and I can, it continues to be brushable when it, I don't have to worry about it cooling off, I can brush it on, I can dilute it with water, it's very useful. Um, no, but, but basically, when you're using wax resist, what you're planning on doing is you're putting the wax on the bisqueware and then and you're keeping the glaze from um, adhering to a certain part of the pot, but then the wax will be removed when you do the glaze firing. During the, during the glaze firing, the wax will burn off, but you can't remove, you can't remove the wax at that point in the early, in the, during the glaze application. If you want to temporarily protect a part of a pot um, from receiving glaze, you can use a removable resist, and the most common one would be latex. It's a latex emulsion, and you can paint it on, let it dry, then you can glaze your piece, and then you can strip off the latex and go ahead and glaze that part or do something to the part with a different glaze, for example, that the, that the, the, the latex had previously covered. The other thing I found that a lot of cases, if I just have a small area I want to coat with wax resist, or, or I want to resist and protect from the glaze, I'll just use masking tape. The same kind of tape that I use for, for painting works great. And actually, I just found another variation of, ma of masking tape that works great. This is painter's tape, but it also comes with a plastic skirt attached. So that, for instance, if I want to, if I want to protect, just put a little glaze on the rim, I can attach this just below the rim, and then the rest of this plastic hangs down and protects the whole rest of the pot from drips and runs and things. So I found this is even, in some cases, this is nice because it has this additional plastic shielding hanging from the bottom of the tape. Very useful. Okay, 
Um, so then, well, the other thing I would recommend, whether you're using latex or whether you're using um, wax resist, any one of these paintable resists, let it dry thoroughly. Because both of these are wax, are water-based emulsions, they contain water, they really won't function completely well to, to repel the water in the glaze unless they're thoroughly dry. Because water likes water, water is attracted to water, so if the wax is slightly damp, it won't repel the glaze effectively. So if you can, be patient, this is part of the mantra for pottery, be patient, be patient, let it dry. I, I usually recommend overnight. And so I'll plan my work so that I'll, I'll wax it one day and then I'll plan on letting it dry overnight and glazing it the next day. And both of those kinds, the latex and the wax, will be most effective if they've had a chance to dry thoroughly. Okay, another, another probably the, the single most, thing I, most important thing that I recommend for before you're glazing, when you're getting ready for your work is, is wipe the surface of the bisqueware with a damp sponge. And this does two things. It, it removes, if you've, ever, if you've ever looked closely at bisqueware, a lot of it, especially porcelain, can contain a lot of fine dust. You want to get rid of that dust from the clay itself. You want to get that off the pot before you, before you glaze it. Um, one of the, and the reason for that is, Again, crawling, we, we'll talk about uh, in another session, and we've, and we've already talked about it previously as far as glaze defects. Claw, the, the defect known as crawling is where the glaze tent doesn't really seem to stick to the, to the pot when it's fired, and it seems to, it's, it adheres, but it moves back, and it leaves bare areas. There are a lot of different causes for crawling, but the underlying cause for the crawling defect is where the, the layer of dried glaze is not adhering tightly to the bisqueware. So anything that's on the surface of the, of the bisqueware that can keep the dried glaze from adhering tightly can lead to, need to crawling. So if there's a layer of fine, loose dust on the surface of the bisqueware, covered by the glaze, that layer of dust can keep the glaze from adhering tightly and it can lead to crawling. The second thing that you want to do that's related to this is by pre-dampening the surface of the, the clay with a sponge, you're not getting it wet, you're just dampening it, is it, it helps the, the water in the, in the glaze actually attra be attracted to and stick to and wet, it's called wetting, it actually wets the surface of the, the, the pot better, and so you get better application. And you see this effect in wetting, probably most noticeably when you're driving your car. If you're driving your car and it starts to rain, you notice when the water first hits the windshield or lands on the hood of your car in front of you, it doesn't just form a sheet and cover the whole car, it tends to bead up. That's because the wax or the finish on your car is preventing the water from actually getting the surface of the car wet. And you also know, I notice it a lot particularly because I'm looking for it, I'll look at the shoulder of the road, especially where there's maybe some bare dirt, and you'll see even on the dirt, the water is not flowing out right away and getting the dirt wet, it's standing in little beads and puddles because the water is, is being repelled by the dust. So this is another reason to get rid of that dust off the surface because since the, the pot is not in the glaze, the wet, in contact with the wet glaze for that long a period of time, you want the water in the glaze to immediately be attracted to the bisqueware and absorbed, pulling the glaze onto the pot. So you don't want anything that's going to prevent that, 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 adhe that adhesion and attraction. So that's another reason to do the, the damp sponge. So I really recommend damp sponge your pots before you glaze them. Um, another thing that's related to this pre-wet, this dampening is you can actually use this pre-wetting or dampening of, your, of the pot to control the glaze thickness. Especially, for example, maybe you have a, a, a series of pots that were under bisqued and if you were to dip those, they bisque at a lower temperature or for less time than you normally would, if you were to dip those in a glaze, you would probably get a thicker than normal application of the glaze because, because of the lower bisque firing temperature, the, the bisqueware is more porous, so it's going to tend to absorb water faster, so you would probably get a, a thicker application, maybe thicker than you wanted. So one thing, if you know that in advance, that the clay is more porous than you like or than you're used to, is pre-wet the clay a little bit before you dip it. That will slow down, then the clay can't absorb as much water, it'll slow down the water absorption and you'll get a, a, a thinner glaze application. So by pre-wetting the, the, the bisqueware very different amounts, you can kind of control the, the amount of glaze that you get and you can offset some of the characteristics of the glaze. If the glaze isn't perfect, you can offset it a little bit by, by pre-wetting the, the bisqueware. Um, another recommendation I have is 
If you have bisqueware or pots that have a, that have very deep texture on them, they're carved, they have grooves or a, a textured pattern, but especially a very deep pattern or thin lines that are deep, if you dip those in a glaze, there's a good chance the glaze will not penetrate to the bottom of those depressions or the bottom of the texture. Because when you submerge it, the, the water that the, I'm sorry, the air that's in those depressions can't escape quickly enough and the glaze just covers them over. And when you take it out, you end up, you can see where there what were air bubbles in the bottom and you didn't get thorough glaze coverage down in all those depressions so what I recommend is before just before you dip the pot in the glaze take a brush and just quickly push some glaze brush some glaze into the bottoms of the depressions it doesn't have to be neat because you're going to turn around and dip it right away but just force some glaze into the bottom of those depressions quickly and then go right ahead and dip it and that way you won't get the trapped air and the bare spots in the bottom of the of the uh, of the depre of the texture Finally, the last comment I had is basically that something to be aware of, if you're using underglazes or stains, thick applications of stains or underglazes can actually also cause crawling. And so the, and what happens is because a lot of the underglazes and the stains don't melt, they just sit on the surface. Well, if they don't melt, they sort of tend to repel the liquid glaze. When the glaze gets up to high temperature and it melts, it doesn't want to bond. There's nothing for it to stick to. So again, it causes crawling. So if you can, Remember that when you're applying underglazes and stains, you're not trying to build up a layer, a thick layer, like you would with a slip. All you're trying to do is color the surface, just barely produce enough to give you the color effect. So try to avoid overly thick layers of stains and underglazes because they can lead to crawling. That's all we had for, the, for this session, this particular session on these particular topics. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank you for visiting with us today, and I hope this information has been useful. If you'd like to support our educational outreach efforts, you can go to patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Um, also check out our website, www.hfclay.com. Next time, the next session, we'll be continuing with this topic of tips for successful glazing, and we'll be talking about the last three sec subjects. On the, on, the, on the material. Thank you very much for coming with us today. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.